In our third session now, we're going to finally get to that question I raised in the first session about, is it the Father who does the hiding and the revealing, or is it the Son who does the revealing? Father, as we tackle this relationship between the Father and the Son and their activity in hiding and revealing things, grant us to be careful. Grant us to to love the Father and to love the Son and to love the relationship between the two. And may we discover things about that relationship here which make us love them more, understand them more deeply, and so follow them as we ought as believers in Christ and the Father, both of whom are the one God. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. At that time, Jesus declared, and remember, at that time is the time of Jesus not doing mighty works, for example, in Tyre and Sidon, even though he said, had he done them there, they would have repented, which means he chose to act in such a way that there was some hiding going on. And the question is, why? And this text is given to answer, why is there hiding going on? Here's his answer. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, absolute sovereign among all the heavenly beings and all that goes on on the earth, including human beings, and whether they are revealed or hidden, that you have hidden these things, the Father has hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them. The Father has revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for thus it was a good pleasure before you. This was God's choice. It was his free good pleasure, just as we're going to see here, to whom the Son chooses, this choosing of the Son and this good pleasure of the Father show that they both are involved in sovereign Good pleasure choosing. Now, key transition. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. Now, why does he say that? Where does that come from? I think we'll see. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Now, the connection with what's gone before, remember the issue there was repentance. He does not reveal to them the mighty works that would have brought about repentance. Well, what's repentance? Repentance is discovering who the Son is and who the Father are so that you can renounce all your sinful ways and all your blindness and turn to the Father and to the Son, begin to see reality for what it is and embrace them for who they are. That's repentance and faith. So we get the same issue up here, up there, and the same issue here, namely How does a person come to know who the Father is and know who the Son is? No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And there's one way into that knowledge. Anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So there'll be no repentance if this doesn't happen. And yet here it says the father did the hiding. He's the one who hindered the repentance and kept it from happening by not, what, commanding or prompting Jesus to do those works. Now, how are we to understand the relationship between the son's 
choosing to reveal to whom he will so that there would be repentance, and the Father's good pleasure to do what he wills so that there is revealed and repentance can happen. And I'm, I'm arguing now that this phrase right here, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, is the key. The reason Jesus introduces this is because he knows what he's about to say. He has just said the Father is the decisive actor in the hiding and the revealing, and he's now going to say the Son is the decisive chooser of who will reveal the Father, of to whom the Father will be revealed. And the connection between the Father's activity and the Son's activity is this all-important sentence. All things, including the Father's activity and right to hide and reveal, all things have been handed over to the Son so that the Son could do the very thing the Father did. Let's see whether that is so. Now, you may wonder, why are you turning to the Gospel of John now? Perhaps you've seen it virtually all uh, serious Bible students agree that the language of those verses right there, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, sounds more like the Gospel of John than anything else in the first three Gospels. This is a way that Jesus talks and John talks in John. So I'm, I'm not surprised <laughs> that I'm going to go and find this in John 3.35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Or chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son cannot do anything of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does. Whoa, that is an incredible statement. Whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he's doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. As the Father gives life, so the Son gives life. All that the Father does, the Son does. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. So the point there is... Whatever the Father does, the Son does. If the Son is doing it, the Father's doing it. The Father's doing it through the Son. Or here we have chapter 17 in John. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh. Everything in this created world, all human beings, you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to whom you have given him. So God is decisive in having a people of his own, and he gives them to the Son, and the Son, therefore, given authority by the Father, has all authority to give them the life that the Father has planned for them. So the Father is accomplishing his saving work of those who belong to him by giving authority to the Son who gives them eternal life. So I come back here, and I see the Father active here, and the Son glorying in the Father. I thank you, Father. I praise you, Father. This is not your ordinary word for thank you. This is a word for praise and confess and agreement and extolling. I, I, I agree with you, Father, in this hiding and this revealing. I agree with, pra with praise and joy, Father. You have done it. And then to clarify for us his role in this, he says, and remember, all things have been handed over to me. All this privilege and right to hide and reveal has been handed over to me by my Father. And then he shows the ground of his own choosing 
No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. So how is anybody going to repent? You can't know who the Son is because only the Father knows the Son, and you can't know who the Father is because only the Son knows the Father. How is anybody ever going to repent of all their blindness and all their sin and actually see God for who He is and embrace Him in the Son for salvation? How's that going to happen? And here's the door that opens. No one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So, conclusion. God hides and reveals and relates to the Son in such a way that all that He is doing, it is really also being done through the Son. The Son's choosing to reveal and the Father's choosing to reveal are one because they are one. Now, there's much more to see in pondering what Jesus means by no one knows the Son except the Father. Why doesn't he say, and to whomever, whoever the Father chooses to reveal him? Because that's exactly what happens in Matthew 16, 17. But that's for next time. <laughs> 